the man in recovery doing my very best to share a positive message of love and hope to anyone out there struggling. My name's Danny Shannon. I spent 17 years in the pain, hurt and misery of active addiction. Heroin, meth, crack, anything you could get your hands on. I am absolutely blessed to have found recovery on the 15th of September 2009. This is the Kick the Shit Podcast. Each week, my guests and I will share our stories around the social and emotional impacts that addiction can have on both ourselves and our loved ones. Let's go. Boom. Hello, wonderful people. Thank you so much for tuning into today's live and our podcast, as you know. As you know, um, I come from an, a background of total abstinence in my own personal recovery, but today we're chatting with the incredible Quinn straight from New York. He has his own unique take on his on his recovery, and he'll be walking us through his life story, showing us how he arrived at the methods that he advocates for today. Let's embrace diversity in the path to recovery and listen to Quinn's story Welcome to the show, Quinn. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Danny. I appreciate it so much, man. It's it's great to it's great to have friends that are so accepting of each other and understanding and have compassion for each other and understand that recovery in itself is the objective. The the whole, you know, there's a mountain. You know, recovery is a mountain and there's so many different paths up this mountain. It doesn't really matter how you get there. It really just matters that we all get there. So I really appreciate having friends like you that, that yeah. see that well, and understand that. So I appreciate it. I, I, I truly love that you've said that. And I just want to say, like, on that note as well, like, I've got to admit, like, I'm a 12-step recovery guy in the beginning and we're going to go this isn't just about our recovery today we're going to go back to your story and we definitely want to hear about how you arrived but what i want to say is for a long time man for 10 years i was like and i hope i still am brainwashed by this total absence based like you must do this you must do that and look man that has saved my life and i'm here but the last few years and being in the role that I am today where I connect with people from all over the world with all different kinds of recovery, I've become so open-minded and how rude of me and to anyone, I think, if we don't share everyone's story and embrace all forms of recovery. So um, I just want to, yeah, I just want to put that out. Also, Quinn, I don't know if you can see in my background, anyone watching, um, I've got New York in my background. I'm actually yeah. totally <laughs> obsessed by New York, so it's, it's such yeah. a pleasure. To meet with you before we get started can i please just give a shout out to koahani uh, for sponsoring this podcast koahani su um, supply ndis supports and support coordination koahani are helping you help yourselves thank you so much for uh, sponsoring the podcast and everyone else i'm um, in the comments too i appreciate you guys being here if you want to hold off to the end and ask questions at the end that would be super cool too um quinn Let's, how are you feeling, bro? You must do a lot of this kind of stuff, do you? Um, it depends. I, 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 I do some for a while, and then I kind of focus in other directions. And then, uh, but recently, I've, I've been collaborating with a lot of people, so I'm, I'm blessed to be in this okay. position where people, you know, like I said, are, are so accepting and, and compassionate and understanding. So it's great. It's been really but great. Like, even as you say that, like, why should, am I right? Like, why shouldn't people be compassionate and understanding? And why do you even have to, like, is that a thing that you need to, um, please, if you don't mind me just asking, Quinn, like, I'm just, shouldn't everyone just be proud of us for just being one? Just, like, I've put down my old way of life and look at this good shit I'm doing. Look at the good shit you're doing today, you know? Isn't yeah, that no, I, I, I totally understand. And I think that the reason why, why some people are, I don't even want to say offended necessarily, but I think that the reason why people who are in recovery with abstinence, where they are completely abstinent from all mood or mind altering substances, they know that that works for them. And I think that's amazing. I think that abstinence is an amazing recovery path for those, for those who can do abstinence because abstinence, true abstinence, no mood or mind altering substances also includes nicotine and caffeine. And I know you're going to say, Oh, well, you know, nobody's ever, nobody's ever, you know, like 
done done you know sexual favors for for caffeine and nicotine right but it's it's the it's the mood or mind altering part and that's the thing too is that like i i don't know anybody who's ever done that stuff for medical marijuana or for wellbutrin or for uh you know pills like lithium you know things that are given for mental health conditions and i think that's where we start to you know where the where it starts to get blurry is like people are like well i have to live in abstinence and we have to ask ourselves well what is true abstinence and are we actually living in abstinence or are we just saying oh well this is my version of abstinence and my version of abstinence includes you know it's okay to have nicotine it's okay to have caffeine it's okay to take medical you know medications for my mental health or maybe i take a sleep aid or maybe you know whatever so everybody kind of has their own opinion of what recovery looks like. And we're getting these words abstinent and sober and recovery and clean and negative and, you know, all these things. It, we're, all, we're getting all these words kind of jumbled up. Uh, sure, and so people who recover through abstinence and they hear, oh, well, there's this term Cali sober where people are recovering through medical marijuana well, to me, that's not recovery, you know, and I understand somebody's point of view who's like, I know for me, I can't have a drop of alcohol. I can't take a hit of weed. I can't take nothing or else next thing I know, I'm going to be banging heroin in the back alleys. It's me. That's my story. Yes. No, totally. I, yeah. Yeah. And, and for a while, I, I, I was there too. Sure. Alcohol was never really my vice. Um, and weed wasn't something that weed was actually more something that like made me honest. Like my sister would freaking anytime she thought that I was using heroin, she would come and smoke weed with me because I would get all like honest and be like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm fucking up and I'm using again. You know what I mean? It was like, <laughs> it was kind of like a savior for me. So I understand why people who recover in abstinence are like, Oh, well, you're not doing it right. Because for them, that's not the program that's right for them, you know. And and in these programs of abstinence, like AA, where abstinence is pushed really hard, we we have to understand that most of those people have a psychological disorder, some kind of mental health condition. You can tell just by looking at them, you know, when they start talking and they're talking a million miles an hour and they've got a full you know energy drink in their hand and they're smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, like that's somebody who has a mental health condition because they're constantly searching for that stimulation that the brain craves. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was me. You, yeah, you, we, we call we call them white knucklers, you know, yeah. they're white knuckling. It's because they're sitting there anxious. They're anxious because they, their brain is craving stimulation. And so those people often have mental health conditions and they should be on some sort of medication. Now for me, I didn't want to go, the medication route as a pharmaceutical because i know the, the the effects of being on pharmaceuticals how bad they are for your liver and for me personally they wanted me on adderall and xanax and lithium which are all pretty highly addictive lithium not, not physically but has a lot of bad side effects so i asked my doctor i said are there any alternatives to being on three more medications, two of which are highly addictive, one of which you can die from withdrawals from. If you if you uh, withdraw from benzodiazepines, you could go into seizures and die. Only two, two drugs are known to do that, and the other one is alcohol. So for me, I was like, after 18 years of addiction, I don't want to go down that path. I don't want to have to take three pills a day every single day for the rest of my life to deal with this stuff. What's an alternative? And they said, well, medical marijuana is an alternative. It'll help your anxiety. It'll help your depression. It'll help your craving for stimulation. And I was like, okay, well, let's do that. Let's try that. Because a plant alternative to me at least is better than a pill. So I was like, let's try that. And it worked for me. It started, it, it started to take away my intrusive thoughts, my anxiety, my depression. It made it so that I wasn't sitting there, you know, white knuckling it, trying to freaking you know, trying to get some stimulation, which my brain often mixed up that stimulation as a trigger. 
because I was like, and my brain was searching for stimulation. But what I understood that as is I want to get high. I just want to get the fuck out of here and get high. I like everything's boring. Life is boring. There's not enough, you know, excitement. I miss the old life. You know, where's all, where's all the good times and oh that feeling and, you know, all this stuff, my brain, I, me personally, I wasn't craving to get high. I wasn't craving to be a drug addict. I wasn't craving to sleep under a bridge. I wasn't craving to like have to watch over my shoulder if I'm getting shot at or arrested or whatever it was. My brain had just associated the feeling of needing that stimulation with drugs. And so I had to understand that like my brain is just crave stimulation. That's part of my mental health condition. You, and you so, celebrated some time at your 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 clean time too, didn't you? You just had a recent a milestone. We know. Just going to say, how long has it been for you that um, you're in recovery for? Thank you. So it's um, so I don't claim to be clean because to me, being clean is is your body is doesn't have any toxins in it. And you're right? talking nicotine. So, yeah, I mean, I mean. Cold. Oh, yeah, cool. Fair enough. Yeah. But, but I've been, I've been what I call Cali sober for three years, October 1st. So it's been three years since I stuck a needle in my arm or, or did any kind of, you know, opiates or, or cocaine or anything like that. Can, can I just say, Quinn, like one of the things that I've learned um, in my journey, let's say in social media too, because of the, the space in social media, I get a lot of messages, right? So I've really started to, change my thinking and I reckon recovery equals our level of happiness like and who is anybody else to say whether you're in recovery or not you know and I think if you are happier and if you're, like I often ask people what's your number on a scale of zero to ten if zero equals you're sad miserable unhappy and ten equals you're just and full of gratitude I think if your number is above a six and you're looking into seven th- and your number used to be a two three four in the old mm-hmm. life I feel like who is anyone else to dictate what recovery looks for other people, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, once once you get to a certain point, I, I you know, like, I agree everybody in the rooms, you know, especially early on into recovery, they need guidance. Absolutely. Yeah. They need guidance. And for for somebody early on in recovery to try to work their own program, I don't recommend it. I think that for me at least because i've been through the steps of aa i actually was abstinent for nine months before i went down my own path and started doing the plant alternatives so i was abstinent and i did complete the steps of aa well you know as as a as a big book dumper myself i should say i'm still working my 12th step because i continue to carry the message for those who still suffer but i didn't get that spiritual awakening as a result of working the steps because i was still white knuckling it in those rooms at 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 nine months of abstinence so i started to look for what is this spiritual awakening that bill wilson was talking about and i think to work the steps and have a program and a good understanding of yourself is is a good basis to then go off and say okay now i have these tools that i got from aa which i think are important like surrendering your will, like finding a higher power, doing your inventory, making amends. I think those are all great tools. And I use those to this day. You know, AA is not, uh, I, just because I'm not abstinent doesn't mean that I think that AA is a bad program. I think AA is a great program. And as a, as a matter of fact, uh, Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, co-founder of AA, uh, in 1934, to get sober, he went and did a treatment in New York City. And in New York City, December of 1934, he did what was called the Towns Lambert Cure. And this was a concoction that he took for three days of belladonna and henbane, which are two psychoactive drugs that make you hallucinate. And he was quoted as saying, he wrote a, he wrote a letter to Carl Jung, the great philosopher Carl Jung, and said, I had a white light experience from this treatment. So that that he later on in 19, uh, 1936 goes to create AA and in the 12th step, 
describes this white light experience. So he is literally quoted as saying he got his white light experience that he mentions in the 12th step from a psychedelic experience, which is a plant medicine. Hey, you know what I mean? You know, <laughs> like I've heard little stories about that. Look, I'm a, I'm an NA member, and I mean, I know it's all, it all comes from from there. And to be honest, like I, I am someone who jumped right in the middle, and I still kind of do. Um, but that story, I've heard, I, I've heard many myths about that story you just said. I feel like that you've probably. Been uh, yeah, no, I've, uh, it interested me so much that I actually did my research and looked into yeah, it yeah. and actually did find evidence and letters. Like I said, he did write to Carl Jung personally. Yeah, well, I, I also feel like the steps for me are a set of instructions on how to live, you know, and that's what they are. Absolutely. Like, I, I used to have extreme problems with drugs while well, I thought I did, but then I discovered actually I'm, I'm the problem, not the drugs, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, you know, so and, and I feel like this. The steps are the instructions on how to live, and that's what I use. I absolutely love that you said that. I think that's yeah. a great, that's a great, great point. Drugs are not the problem. We're the no. problem, right? No. And and really, that's really, that's like saying drugs aren't the issue. It's my relationship with the drugs that are the issue, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So like, so like opiates, you know, they use those in the hospitals for people who have to go through surgery, you know, yeah, anesthesia and things like that, epidurals for, for pregnant women, there's opiates and all those things, you know? So, so we're not going to tell a woman who is a recovering heroin addict. Oh no, you don't get the epidural because it's got opiates in it and you're a recovering heroin addict, right? That would be insane because, because having an epidural while somebody is pregnant, that's, what normal people are supposed to do right that's what that's what is expected for sure, for sure. now it's, she's it's, not going to go off and sneak start sneaking epidurals and freaking ODing on epidurals you know what i mean there's a time and place for drugs yeah yeah well look when i would you know like and i know you know too we would do anything for like i've man i once ended up with this medical kit, right? Here's an example. Sorry, just to go off track for a sec. It had methadone, I mean, it had morphine, pethidine, valium, and then there was this one the drug that I'd never heard of. Um, and I looked it up and even I used all those three. Then I looked up that last one and it said, don't use it. And sure enough, I'm injecting it. <laughs> and I went crazy. It was some antipsychotic and I hung out like I couldn't get rid of this feeling for days. So what I'm, my point is we will go, so if I could get my hands on an epidural when I was using it, I would be shooting that up. Um, I just feel like this subject for people in this total absence space and certainly in 12-step fellowship, it must be so, – it is such a conflict. And I know for them, because I was there and I am there, it's such a conflict to get my head around. And you say it, Quinn, but it's such a conflict to get your head around. Like how come you can have – medical marijuana and identify as being in recovery but i can't and let me tell you my people anyone on my sort of um, recovery trust me if i have a bong i'll be shooting up smack in 45 minutes i believe that maybe half an hour actually so i um, just want to reintegrate that you know? no i think i think that i think that <clears throat> i think it's great that you know what your limit is that's great you know what i mean I yeah. think that it's great and, and because you yourself have sat down with yourself and you have been like, okay, let's just be honest. Like if I do this, I know something that's going to make me want to drink. And if I drink, I'm going to fucking want to shoot up. And if I shoot up, I know it's going to be the end of it because I'm going to sell everything I've got. And I've actually amounted with quite enough sh shit now to fucking last me a little while, you know? So I love that you figured that out for yourself. For me, I think I've drawn the line, you know, where you perhaps have drawn the line at caffeine and nicotine. Yeah. I have drawn the line just a little bit further and been like, you know what? I understand yeah. that, like, if I do a line of Coke, I'll probably end up doing heroin because I hate the come down of Coke. So I'll probably end up doing heroin at the same time. But for me personally, I can I, I, I can do the nicotine. I can do the caffeine. And I've also added medical marijuana to the mix. You know what I mean? And for me, I know that instead of being on a pharmaceutical 
that I know I'm going to have to go to the pharmacist for all the time. I'm going to have to remember to take it every day or else I'm going to feel like shit or, yeah. you know, plus all the, sh the liver damage that the pills are going to take on, you know, every single day for me, I'm like, okay, this is, this is a good alternative for me. And, you know, like I said, I, I don't think that it's the right path. I don't think it's the only path. I don't think that it's the, the, you know, I, I don't, want to push that on anybody and mm -hmm. i only speak from my experience you know and i have a lot of people who tell me hey i relate to that and this is how i feel and this is what i'm doing you know and we have actually started here in in the united states programs based around this new recovery path that we have deemed cali sober yeah it's, it, i've never I, i'm pretty I think i started hearing about it from you you know i've got a good idea queen like like I look at you today, right? And I've been following you, <coughs> upstanding, <coughs> intelligent guy who presents well to the world, educating people. Now, surely your addiction took you some. I bet you, when you were on the heroin and the crack and all that, you weren't that person. So why don't we go back now? Why don't we go back now and tell me a little bit about where did you grow up? I know you came to America. I was going to say Australia. Um, you came to America at age four from France. Um, yeah, and so can do you mind? Are we ready? Let's go back and talk a little bit about your story and um, and basically compare what your rock bottom was compared to who you are today as well. I think it's important for our viewers to to hear that. Okay, uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I moved to America when I was four years old with my mom and my older brother. My Dad stayed in France, so my parents divorced. We moved to the States. I didn't speak a word of English. Neither did my mom, neither did my brother. We all started with basically the backpacks that we had on, and my mom busted her ass to build a, a good life for us, you know, um, and she struggled to do that, having an accent and everything, you know, being a – she was she still is a very beautiful woman. She had – uh, you know, people hitting on her. I mean, this was 80s and 90s. So, you know, misogyny was a lot worse back then than it is now. Um, there wasn't like, you know, the Me Too, HR and all that stuff like there, you know, like there is now. Um, so she struggled heavily to, to raise us and to try and provide a good uh, household for us. But we also lived, you know, outside of our means. We, we are, were often, you know, alone. My mom was working so much. The kids were left to their own devices. We were, you know, basically raised on the streets as kids, you know, um, just not, not like we were just the typical kids of the eighties and nineties running around till the freaking, you know, till it was dark, no cell phones, no tabs on anybody, you know, everybody was kind of had their own little hustle and everything. Where? Running around where? Like, where are you? Just take me. Where are you? Like, running around, like, New York? So this was, no, this was in uh, Utah. This was in uh, West Valley, Utah, kind of a bad yeah. part of uh, Salt Lake City, uh, okay. out on the west side of Salt Lake City, where there's gangs and, and shootings and all those, those types of things. So we were kind of just, just out on the streets, you know, being little hoodlums, you know. Yeah. Yeah. causing trouble, you know, stealing street signs and, and, you know, breaking windows and just stupid kid yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, I started getting into fights because I was getting heavily bullied for my accent. Uh, the fact that I was from France didn't really, you know, people were, I don't know, they really freaking dogged on me for that. Um, I was also very awkward and shy. And um, at the age of seven, I was molested by my neighbors. So at that point, me being seven years old, not growing, having not having you know a real strong father figure, my mom was you know working a lot, trying to provide for us, me out on my own devices. I just basically started having really dark thoughts about myself, about you know my self worth early on from a child uh, I started to believe that you know love didn't love didn't you know love was a, a, a touch and it wasn't an emotion 
um, that people had to, you know, treat me a certain way or treat me badly to give me emotions. And I grew up in a very dark solitude um, of really self, like low self-worth, low self-esteem. Um, my mom basically, well, my mom said that I was like out of control and she sent me to when I was 15. And she sent, you I, she sent me to France, back to France oh. to live with my dad when I was 15. And up until that point, my mom was my, my rock. You know, she was the only stable parent anything we had moved times by the time I hit junior high she was the only stable thing in my life and she was like look like you got to go stay with your dad and so I was like everything in me shattered you know I had I had no home I had no security I had no I had no I, I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere I had no self-esteem no self-worth and all these things and I think all that trauma just really kind of just made me be in a dark place for a long time and I think that constant, constant trauma at such a young age kind of affected my mental health. Right. May, may I ask you, um, the incident happened, you were sexually assaulted at seven. Um, is that when you said at seven? Did you? Did you yeah, from that? the age of five to seven. Yeah, can you please tell us, like, because I know this happens to so many people. It's like almost every single person I interview, someone's been through this, and no wonder people end up with heroin and, and drug addictions. Would you mind just touching on that for a second and tell us, did you, did mum know, and is there anything you would do differently? Could you help educate someone else what they should do in this situation? Um, is there anything you can share more around that to help? Um, I anyone? mean, so when it happened, um, you know, it started from five to seven years old, and I and I'm not sure if it was my, the language barrier between me and my mom, on top of me being really ashamed of what happened, on top of um, you know thinking that I was going to get in trouble for it, uh, and probably not really understanding how to express myself. Um, I I remember trying to approach my mom about it. And my brother actually caught the kids. So it was like one neighborhood kid was trying, was like basically sexually abusing all the neighborhood kids. There's like five or six of us making us do stuff with each other, making us do stuff with him, making us do stuff with him and his girlfriend. Um, and they were only a few years older than us. They were only like three or four years older than us. So they were still pretty young themselves. Yeah. Um, but I, I remember trying to, talk about it to my mom and it not getting the attention that I thought that it should get. And so knowing what my mom had been through because she had been through a really dark childhood that also involved a lot of sexual abuse, um, I kind of was like, okay, well, mine wasn't as bad as what she experienced. So maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe it wasn't that big of a deal. You know, and I carried that with me for until I was thirty. Well, Quinn, so so actually, like in asking you that, like you tried. You said you tried to fuck. What's the like? I can't imagine, man. I'm so like I just feel like this world sometimes is such a horrible place because I just and I don't mean to like I'm usually full of optimism and stuff, but sometimes when I hear this stuff, like I just and I just want to acknowledge anybody out there as well, and to you, Quinn. Like I can't possibly imagine what it's like to go through that and i feel like you know like i just wish there was a way we could help educate and get people to speak up but you try it you try to the language barrier between you and your mom and also her own grief and story around the similar incidents um, prevented her from being able to to be there for you yeah i mean i think i think it was just uh it was just an unfortunate way of, uh, of, of things. You know, I think I, I also didn't really know how to express myself enough. Mm. Um, but from that point, so I, so I was living in France, you know, in this dark place, I go back to the States and once I get to the States, I'm at, I'm at like, you know, I'm at the point of wanting to like kill myself. How old are you? At, at 15 say? years old. Okay, yeah. uh, 15 years old. And I'd say, I'd say probably 11 was the first time I really thought of suicide. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, but at 15 years old, I start meeting some friends. We start skating. Um, it was like the most like stable house that I had been at in years because I'd been moving from year to year to year for the last record six years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'm enjoying this time here. My friends start like getting into smoking weed and stuff. And it wasn't the weed that I was craving. It was the, it was the validation. It was like that people love me. It was that, you know, people want to be around me, that I was a cool person that, you know, like everything that they teenagers crave, you know, attention and freaking to be accepted and to be, you know, part of a community, part of something that, you know, is worth like waking up for in the morning. And so I joined this group and basically we, we started all experimenting with drugs, started throwing parties at my house raves doing ecstasy cocaine followed everything else um and then it was actually it was actually right before i started throwing parties and everything though that i had gone through surgery and at this point i was only smoking weed and but i had gone through surgery and i think this was actually probably the tipping point for me i'd gone through surgery they had prescribed me oxycontin and i took it for a couple weeks and once i stopped taking it I started to get this really, you know, I started going through withdrawals, which at 16, I didn't know what withdrawals were. Nobody told me like, hey, you know, like if you take these for too long, you know, you're going to go through physical withdrawal. Nobody told me that. The doctor didn't say anything. It's just like, here you go. Take these. When you're done with them, you're good. That was your first. I thought it was like. That was your first. um, Yeah. And so. So I'm taking the oxys and I'm smoking weed at the same time, you know, because I was smoking weed and I didn't think that oxy cotton was really a freaking, you know, I, I just thought it was a medication, you know, yeah. like obviously as a painkiller is my first surgery. I'd never taken painkillers before, but you know, that's what they said. It's a painkiller. Here you go. Like you don't really understand what that means when you're 16. You go to surgery, they give you medication, you take the medication because your doctor told you to take the medication because you just went through surgery. (laughs) You know what I mean? That's what I was doing. But then I started enjoying that high. I started enjoying that feeling. And then when I didn't have them anymore, I was like, oh, well, you know, I feel like shit. Where do I get more? And then because I knew people who were doing those things in high school, I was like, okay, well, let me get these. And then I started, my friends started asking for them. So I started to get them for my friends and I started selling. And by 18 years old, I was selling everything under the sun from mushrooms to Oxycontin, ecstasy. Uh, I was selling steroids. I was selling uh, Xanax and, and Klonopin and everything else. But I hadn't yet started selling any kind of like heroin. Um, I had sold Coke, but not a whole lot because I didn't like the the incessant calling of for for people who wanted cocaine all the time um but then in the summer of uh in the summer of the year i turned 18 uh i discovered heroin my friend was like hey i've got some blah 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 and opium had been floating around there quite a bit and everybody wanted opium everybody was smoking opium blah 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 and then there, and then my buddy was like, "Well, opium's best, basically heroin. Do you want to try heroin?" And I was like, "Sure, why not?" But I smoked it. I didn't. I didn't start shooting for like five years, but I smoked it and was like, instantly, I was like, "This is this is it, like this, holy shit!" And what I didn't know is that what was happening is that the floodgates in my brain for the dopamine were basically being released. You know, my brain was just like, oh, boom, here's the rush of adrenaline and dopamine and serotonin and everything. Here you go. Here it is. Here's all of it at once. And that's why often, you know, people say, oh, we're chasing that high, that first high that we got, because it is actually doing something. It's not just it's not just something that addicts say it is actually doing something. It's opening the floodgates of the chemicals that we are stored in our that are stored in our brain. You know, so we fall in love with that feeling, literal falling in love. The same chemicals that are released when you fall in love are released when you take that hit of whatever it is, cocaine or meth or or heroin. Quinn, when when you were on the the oxys or the, the, um, went from the um, previous incident, was it different to the opium? Um, 
like it's the same drug, isn't it? Like I'm just oh, okay. to the like, opium or to heroin. Uh, well, well, I'm thinking you said it was oxy's you were on in the beginning, yeah. yeah? The first yeah. described, and then you when when you compare the oxy's, you know that you started to like the oxy's, you started to abuse mm -hmm. them. It then went down that path. So when you smoked opium for the first time, you talk about it like that was the first time you the floodgate opened. But was, no, was no, the opium, no, the opium. Sorry if I if I misworded that. No, the opium had just been kind of floating around. People had been putting on top of weed yeah, to like right. kind of get an extra little high, kind of like keef or something. But opium wasn't really like it wasn't a thing that I was attracted to, you know, oh, yeah. it was, it was when somebody said, Oh, well, do you want to try heroin? And I was like, Oh no, I don't want to try that. And they're like, Oh, well, it's just like that opium that everybody oh, is smoking yeah. around here. Anyway, I was like, Oh, well I've done that. And that's not like super crazy or anything. So sure. Why not? You know? Yeah. Um, and then, and then when I tried the, the heroin on tinfoil and I got that instant freaking oh. release that that instant yeah. body high i was like oh shit this is it and i experienced that again the first time when i shot up heroin yes. i was like oh okay holy shit like what have i been wasting my life on this whole time this is what i should have been doing you know because that's what's happening is is it's like you're falling in love that's and it's actually it's Thanks. actually it's actually it's scientifically proven the same chemicals are released when you fall in love than when you take a, a hit of meth or coke or heroin or whatever but it's actually 10 times that amount than you would if you fell in love so just imagine for a second what it feels like to fall in love right how amazing that feeling is when you, you've been dating a girl for like a month or two or whatever and you guys are like starting to really like vibe or whatever and and then like one of you finally like accidentally like slips it out, oh, I love you. And you're like, oh, what? You know, oh, and then you're like, I love you too. And you're just like, holy shit, like this person all, you know, everything I've been working for is like at least feels normal. It feels right, it feels good. And this person appreciates who I am enough to say that they love me as a person, that's huge. You know, imagine that feeling for just one second and then times it by 10. That's what's happening when you're taking drugs, you know? So, so it's hard not to want that feeling, you know what I mean? Um, but anyway, so from that point, it just started to spiral. It was just like, I was chasing that, you know, I was just, I was trying to run from the pain, you know, the trauma, the freaking the molestation, the, the, the abandonment, the freaking, you know, growing up without any feeling like I didn't have much security or much uh, community or much self-esteem or anything like that. Um, it just kept getting worse and worse. At 25 years old, I wake up one morning and I had to go to surgery again for a testicular torsion, which is where one of your testicles wraps around the other one. I go in for a surgery and they tell me, okay, we have to operate. I was like, okay. So they do the operation. I was heavy on Coke and heroin at the time. The operation goes fine. They hit me with the adrenaline to wake me up out of the anesthesia and the cocaine and the adrenaline just like made my, my, my heart rate skyrocket. And I blew my coronary artery. I went into cardiac arrest and uh, they called my mom and my sister and my brother. And they're like, Hey, come to Utah and tell your son goodbye. Cause he's not going to make it. He's not going to get out of this coma. Like he's, he's basically like he's gone. So they all came to see me. <clears throat> my sister got there in time for them to like sign on putting me on, uh, on life support. And I was in a coma for five days. So they wake me up. Uh, I woke up on, uh, November 11th of 2011. So 11, 11, 11, I was given a new, a new beginning on life. Um, but even that they told me, you know, you've done so much damage to your heart. Uh, we give you, we don't give you, we don't see you making it past six months. So at that point I was like, okay, I've got six months to live. Um, you know, what the fuck? Like, might as well just go like, you know, go out with a bang. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to sit around here and freaking like wait to die. Like I'm going to freaking continue the lifestyle that I know best. I'm going to be ripping and running the streets. And I'm going to go hard as ever. And so for the next 11 years, I thought I was going to die tomorrow. You know, every day that was over six months, I was like, I'm going to die any fucking day. 
So I started, I started doing just worse shit. I started doing home invasions. I started uh, robbing people. I started doing scams where I would steal from one store and sell it back to a different store. I was pawning stuff. I was, you know, going, going around at night, breaking into cars, breaking into houses, going and selling, you know, pawning things. Um, and all while I was also selling drugs. And then I moved to Georgia. I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, where things got way worse. Atlanta, Georgia was just like, I was living in a terrible neighborhood where there was just a huge, there was a huge house, um, junkyard area where they sold crack and heroin. There was a, a big uh, hotel that sold crack across the freeway. And I was doing my little hustles with selling crack and heroin stuff going through different drug dealers you know playing the game and the hustle and I was just it was just really rough on me uh being the minority and also just like being a real vulnerable type person at that time um I was often getting in fights getting getting jumped um I've been shot I had to shoot at people I've done you know I've done stuff where you know i've had to sell my body to women for drugs uh, i've lived under a bridge i lived in a car in front of a trap house that for for months where the car was broken down and the freaking uh windows were blacked out with with trash bags i mean that was my rock bottom when i was sitting where were you in, shot were you shot yeah i was shot in my leg running away from a drug dealer for 60 dollars. <laughs> sorry i should laugh I should... <laughs> no it was it was Looking back, it it's one good. of the funniest fucking stories that I that you would ever think. And it happened in broad daylight. Uh, and then after it happened, after he shot me as I'm running away, he like got on top of me, started beating me up, and I'm like screaming in the middle of the you know in the middle of this field, and it's broad daylight. I'm like help, because I thought he was gonna kill me. And I was so, so I was like, hopefully I can get somebody's attention, and then he won't kill me, you know, in broad daylight. And uh, so finally, like, after like 30 seconds or something, he like gets up and he's just like walks away and says something I can't even remember. But a car drives past, stops, looks at me, and I like kind of like stand up, like poke my head out of the freaking out of the shrubby grass and stuff. And I'm like, like fucking, you know, bleeding and stuff. And they're like, yeah, you're all right. And then they just kept driving by. And I was like, I've just been shot in the middle of Atlanta. <laughs> and and they're like, they see me get up out of the freaking grass. So they're like, he's fine. <laughs> still alive. Be, yeah, they're probably scared. So what, what happened? Did you have to get surgery on that? What do they do? When you well, so it went, it went uh, through the back of the through the back of my thigh, basically. Uh, and it was really more of just a flesh wound. So I didn't have to go to the hospital, thank God, because oh, going to the hospital, I would, they would have said like, who shot you and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And if anything would have happened, I would have gotten killed. If that guy would have gotten arrested for anything after yeah. that point, they would have said, oh, Quinn snitched on him and they've been watching him since then. So they would have put the green light on me. So I was living, I was living in the trap house trying to shoot up heroin for 45 minutes or so because I couldn't find a vein. You know, after after 15 years of shooting up, my veins were just completely shot. So I'm trying to shoot up and I, I finally get the blood in the, in the needle, finally registers. I'm like, yes, thank God. I go to push the plunger and it just stings. Stings like hell. I'm, so I know I'm missing. I'm like, fuck getting all agitated i'm already in i'm already in withdrawal at this point so sensitive you know just the just, you know okay. trigger warning you know trying to get a freaking uh, trying to get a freaking dull needle freaking non-existent veins when you're already in withdrawal is one of the worst pains you can fucking experience but i've been doing it for 45 minutes at this point got the blood in the needle doesn't work looking and looking looking again finally find again uh, it registers i go to push in and the fucking blood would co the blood had coagulated and fucking clogged the needle and i'm i'm fucking so overwhelmed at this point i just like i lost my shit i fucking stood up and i threw the freaking needle against the wall and i just start fucking screaming 
And I'm like, why, God, why? Why me? Why did you choose this for me? What the fuck did I do to deserve this? Like, fuck it. And I got down on my knees and I started crying. And I was like, God, for like, please just either take my life or give me strength. I can't fucking do this anymore. And I was crying and I found the needle on the ground and I ripped, and, you know, I broke the little tip off and I squirted that shit in my mouth with the coagulated blood in it. And I fucking laid down and I grabbed my dog and I just fucking cried and I cried. And I mean, I, I guess, I guess that was enough to take away the withdrawals. I woke up the next morning and I called my mom. And I said, mom, I need help. Like, get me the fuck out of here, please. Yeah. Fucking, I, I need to do this. Um, <clears throat> so then I went to the program. I went to, I went to sober living. I got sober. I got, uh, you know, I, I got, I got, I detoxed for 30 days at my sister's house. And then I got into a sober living down in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and then I did nine months of abstinence. And like I said, I was white knuckling the whole time. And then, and then after that, uh, I was like, you know what? Um, so I was white knuckling the whole time through, through AA, I get on my motorcycle and because my mind was still sick because I was still having the intrusive thoughts from my mental health, from the trauma, from the PTSD, from the ADHD. I wasn't doing, you know, I was spending my money in, in other places that I shouldn't have, not drugs, but I was going out to dinner with cute girls instead of paying for my motorcycle insurance, um, which was to me not sober thinking. My, you know, I was clean, but I wasn't sober at that point. Uh, and so I get on my motorcycle and I'm riding and I'm going 123 miles an hour. Uh, it's like 260 kilometers and 260 kilometers an hour or something like that. Um, and the cops see me and I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm going so fast. They're not going to stop me. So I just kept driving. I just kept going. And I get to the next red light a couple a couple miles down, a couple of kilometers, whatever. <laughs> trying to keep it, trying to keep it uh, uh yeah, yeah. Um, but they find they they catch up to me and I was like, oh shit, well, I've already, you know, I'm I, I don't have a license and they already caught me going over a hundred miles an hour. Let me, you know, I'm just gonna get the hell out of here. I'm just gonna lose them. So I led the cops on a, on a high speed chase for 15 minutes going in and out of traffic, down the wrong way on, on incoming traffic, blew through a few red lights, going, you know, speeding through school zones, driving on, on sidewalks, um, just like I broke every traffic violation there was, um, including a felony of fleeing, fleeing and attempting to elude an officer. So I crashed my bike because I, I was going around this corner and right as I'm going around the corner, this van pulled out and I hadn't expected that. So I couldn't cut the corner as, as steep. So I had to correct myself. And when I went back to correct my, my handlebars just like made me flip over, uh, kind of like did a speed wobble almost. And I flipped over my handlebars and crashed my bike. And all of a sudden I just have like 50 cop cars you know, pushing on me. So I go to jail for 30 days. And when I get out, I don't, I've lost, I've lost my spot in sober living. And so basically I'm homeless in Savannah. And because of 18 years of uh, training your brain to do a certain thing, my brain said, well, let's go back to hustling. Let's go back to, you know, what we know best because we don't have a job. We don't have a license. We don't have a car. We don't have all these things anymore. <clears throat> I don't have a home. So how are we going to freaking get back on our feet? Well, let's start selling drugs and start making friends with these people, blah, 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 blah. Went back to my old friend's house, started selling drugs, doing all this shit. And my final, so at this point, I had some grasp of sobriety though. And I knew that it was achievable if I wanted it, if I fucking worked hard enough for it, but I didn't know how to really like maintain my sobriety. So I'm, I'm trapping out of this house and uh, my roommates are, are, are selling drugs. We're all, we're all selling drugs and stuff. And we go to our, our main dealer's house and he had just re-upped. And while my roommate and him are doing the deal, uh, I look over and the dude's pistol is sitting right here on the uh, bedside table. So in my mind, 
I'm like, I, I'm like, okay. His girlfriend just walks out to do another deal downstairs. I grab the pistol and I'm like, I'm going to kill these two right now. And I'm going to take all the dope. And I was like, hold on. If I kill these two right now, the girlfriend is going to come back and she's going to see them dead. She's going to know I was the last one because I'm not there. You know, so she's going to know it was me and she's going to turn me in, whatever. So I'm going to wait until she comes back and then I'm going to kill all three of them. And then I was like, well, I drove here with my roommate, you know, not my roommate, but he was another dude that lived at the trap house and there was a camera outside. So they're going to know they're going to tie it to me. So I can't I can't kill my roommate. So. So, I, you know, so basically I'm like going through like how I'm going to fucking commit this triple homicide or double homicide or whatever. And um, and I decide, OK, I'm just going to come back later and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to find a way to, to rob these guys later. And uh, I get home, we get to the apartment that we're trapping out of and we're you know doing the dope and stuff. And I threw something down on the ta- I threw my phone down on the table and it, it like busted my friend's TV called up my mom and I was just like, I was so overwhelmed. I was just like, mom, I need help. I'm going to get kicked out of my apartment because, you know, I broke this TV and they're going to freak out. I'm going to be homeless. And my mom, out of everything, she, she, she just couldn't stand the thought of me being homeless. So I'd use that to manipulate and lie to her a lot. And uh, so she, she was like, well, I can't do, I can't help you, but your sister's going to come down there and she's going to help you out. And uh, so my sister came down to Savannah, Georgia. And she was like, bro, you're, you're fucking up. Like get your ass in the fucking truck because you're relapsing again. I know it. Like we need to get you some help. You know, you were doing good. You were going through AA, you were doing sober living. You were on the right path. Like, let's get you back to that point. And I was like, I was like, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I packed my shit and I got in the car and I fucking, drove back to to columbus georgia which is where my sister was living at the time and i just sat at home and fucking did nothing for the next six months i did absolutely nothing she's like i don't want you to fucking look for a job i don't want you to freaking I, i don't want you to call any friends i don't want you to have any people over i don't want you to do anything but figure out yourself bro like figure out what the fuck is going on and like what it is that you need to do because like obviously you don't want to live like this figure it out I was like, you're right. You know, and I started to go to AA again and I started to look more into this white light awakening. But through the whole thing, I was smoking medical marijuana to relieve my anxiety, to relieve my depression, to relieve my, you know, intrusive thoughts so that I didn't want to like, like being able to smoke weed made it so that I didn't have the craving of wanting to go and stick a needle in my arm. And anytime my brain was like, oh, well, I'll just go and stick a needle in my arm. I was like, no, that's not, that's not what I'm doing anymore. I just don't accept that that is the life that I'm going to live from now on. I'm not that person anymore. And I'm going to figure out what I have to do to change. Whatever that path looks like for me, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to stick to it. And I just, and I, and you know, I, I just started to change that neuro, those neurological passages in my brain. That were telling me, hey, you're high, you're 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 craving stimulation. Let's get high. I started to change those neurological passages to think, hey, you're craving stimulation. Let's play video games, or let's work on a video, or let's learn something. Let's read a book. Let's do some psychology. Let's exercise. Let's do some communication courses. You know, I started to rewire the way my brain thought about what it was that I was actually craving which was the dopamine and the stimulation that I was getting through drugs. And then I trained my brain to get it through substances. So once you trained your brain to get dopamine and serotonin and all these other things through substances, that's what your brain is going to immediately go to. It's going to like, Oh, that's what we always do. Duh. But you have to fight that. And so once I started to fight that and be like, I know that's what we always do, but that's not what we're doing anymore. So let's find another way. How else can we create? How else can we get this dopamine flooding? How else can we get this cre- this stimulation going? And um, so yeah, so that's you know that to me, that's how I got out of it. I was like, this is this is, and and just like you were saying, you know, you know your limits, and I know mine. I was like, my limit is that I just I know, 
I can't do coke or, or heroin ever again. You know, no yeah. pills, yeah. no anxiety meds, you know, no Adderall, like yeah, well, nothing like that. that. It's just, yeah. yeah. So, well, man, well, and, and, and now it's been three years um, on, on this path, um, no more, yeah, none of that. It's been three years since we've had any of that, and that includes um, the, the, the heavy drugs as well. So let me ask you this. Yeah. If if they were to tell you tomorrow that you had some kind of life-threatening ailment yeah. and that there is a possible cure or there's a possible, you know, there is like a way to relieve you from your symptoms. Yeah. Would you take it <laughs> or, or would you suffer with your ailment? Yeah, I totally get it. Yes. It's like, Yes, queen. Yeah. Always, always so it, so it's really just what, you know, like I said, drugs have their purpose in the right setting. You know, Adderall helps people with ADHD. If they abuse it, no, that's not good. If they take it well as prescribed, that's normal. You know, people who have bipolar disorder have to take Wellbutrin along with, you know, Lexapro and other things. You know, if they abuse it, yes, that can be bad. But if you take it as prescribed, then can, can, I, can I flip that 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 same um, yeah. scenario as well? Like they also say, like if you had cancer um, and and you knew that there was that treatment available, you would take it, right? Um, another thing that was said to me, the choice their fellowship. So if you're willing to do that, why aren't you willing to come to meetings and, and try this way as well? You know, like if if, there, if there's a treatment. Um, you're going to take it if you're sick. So you are sick, Danny. Why don't you come? You know, <laughs> and, and, and look, that works for me as well. So Yeah, no. And, and that's the thing is, that, like, crazy. you don't. You don't have an ailment. So why would you need to take something, you no, know? Right. Yeah, but for right. somebody but for somebody who has a mental health condition, yeah, you know. Yeah, totally, brother. I'm so, yeah, yeah, yeah. One other one I love, I just want to pull this out there too, is, like, just because I'm in the 12 step fellowship too, like if my car breaks down, I can't just pull out the fucking big book and smack it over the bonnet either. Like that ain't gonna fix it. Like I need to put in the action to make shit happen too, you know? Yeah. Like everything we do, there's a massive level of accountability that I need to, you know, to keep myself safe. And for me, yeah, I I wonder you know, let's go back for a sec. You know, you picked up at nine months. Like, you were nine months clean and sober in AA. Or, yeah. no, actually, you said not sober. You said clean because you felt like you were still not able to think properly because of Absolutely. all the mental health stuff. But Absolutely. would you um, suggest, like, I wonder what the limit is. How long do you have to, what was it, white knuckle it before? Like, what if you go three years or six years? Um, in AA or in t total absence space, surely there's a point, a cutoff that maybe picking up medical marijuana isn't the answer. Oh, well, actually, I guess it depends how much you white knuckle it. Well, much. I mean, it depends. If if I hadn't gotten evaluated by a doctor and hey, the doctor and, and the doctor oh. and the doctor tells me, you know, hey, this is. This is why you're experiencing this, these symptoms. You have a mental health condition, yeah. and this is what we, you know, this is what we do with people who have mental health conditions. We prescribe them medications to regulate their mind chemicals, basically, right? So, so to me, there's no, you don't get rid of a mental health condition. So whether I were to wait a six months or a year or 10 years in 10 years i will still have a mental health condition it'll get worse too won't it it will literally get worse. It, it's it's yeah. possible it's possible that it gets worse it's possible that i learn to live you know manage it better you know i learned to live with it but that's what i'm saying is like i was in there white knuckling it nobody this is just my opinion nobody with no months of should be fucking hating sobriety. You know, yeah. nobody who's got nine months of abstinence and is working a program. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's not. Yeah, that. really get that. 
that. I really understand that, man. I really, you can, um, I really get that. And I, I wonder, like, what, like, wonder when is the point that you might consider such a thing? Can I, before we go, we're, we're wrapping it up. I want to hear from you two questions I want to ask you before we wrap it up, and then we'll take some questions. I know there's been bulk comments and questions coming in but i want to share i recently done a podcast interview with a woman um shannon big shout out to us right and she um she spoke about marijuana being her drug of choice okay and now her drug of choice but not only her drug of choice but how so many people shamed her to say that um when she'd say like drug marijuana ruined my life and then so that was her story, right? And, of mm -hmm. course, that's very, very possible. Now, I put out a promo clip. That promo clip one the one, most one that blew up the most because so many haters, man, so many people out there want to bag her for mm -hmm. saying that her, she said, right, she made a statement, marijuana is just as bad as heroin, right? Now, fine, she can say whatever she wants, just like you can and just like everyone else out there too. But because of that post, so many people got in the – in the comments and bless you shannon if you're watching because i've have never shared this with you i don't want you to see all that hate but um people um just really got on this bandwagon there's some nasty people out there man, who want to like i feel like again we're all on our own individuals for some one person if pot is as bad as heroin for them let them have that like you know yeah this well that's that's a great point so like i said you know how i mentioned how when we do drugs we release the floodgates, right? Yeah. The dopamine, the serotonin. So it could be anything. It can be food. It can be yes, weed. Yes, it can yes. be heroin. It's yeah. not the, it's not the substance. And this goes back to what you said earlier. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, it's, it's not, it's not about the drug. The drug doesn't need to change. It's my relationship with yeah. the drug that needs to change. Yeah. And so it's not the substance itself. It's not the weed. It's not the heroin. It's not the Coke, the meth, whatever. It's the obsession, right? Because that's what the relationship is, is the obsession with the drug, right? So it's the obsession that needs to be addressed. And it's the obsession that drives us to do those things, you know? And, and so, yeah, I absolutely think it's possible that somebody has a craving for the obsession to escape or to numb or to feel validated or to mask you know, absolutely. I think it's possible to do it with food. It's possible to do it with relationships. It's possible to do it with many, many things. It's totally. the relationship that is toxic. Yeah, totally, man. Look, it's been such a great conversation. Thank you so <laughs> yeah. much for sharing all this. Show. I, I, I want to finish with this last, last thing. <laughs> I worked in treatment for 10 years, right? Over 10 years. I used to, I've done hundreds of assessments. And I reckon, right, this is just my own personal opinion, I reckon I can tell the difference between a pot smoker, an alcoholic, a heroin addict, and a meth head. There's literally four people, four different body languages and stuff. I can tell within a minute, <laughs> and this is maybe getting a bit cocky, but what your drug of choice is. And on that note, pot is a real fucker too. Like I've seen it, like memory loss, um, psychosis, um, like the, it definitely can have its bad effects too, can't it? Yeah. Oh, I, I absolutely. You know, anything, yeah. So there's there's actually a lot of uh, cases currently here in the United States of people going into psychosis from smoking yeah, too absolutely. much concentrate. Now I haven't seen it happen from people smoking flour, like just medical marijuana. But the concentrates, the concentrates yeah, yeah. are are you know they can be harmful. Yeah, you know, sure. and, and just like and just like with with too much of anything, you know, if I'm if I broke my leg and I get painkillers from the from the doctor, if I take one painkiller a day, that's managing. If I yeah. take 10, 10 of them in a day, that's abusing. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, if I'm if I'm prescribed medical marijuana, which I am for my anxiety and depression, I'm prescribed by a doctor of medical marijuana here in, in this in the state of New York. So if I take it as prescribed, then I can expect for my mental health to improve, my anxiety to decrease, my depression to decrease, my, my obsessive compulsive disorders to decrease. And therefore, I don't try to use hardcore substances to numb, escape, or validate, deal with the obsession that I have.
Now, a really great point that I have is, you know, in rehab, I love that you mentioned that you work in a, that you worked in a uh, recovery facility for 10 years. That's amazing. And I appreciate your, your time in, in doing that. Um, as you may know, in, in recovery programs like rehabs, if you have a mental health condition and you have a prescription from a doctor, they will disperse that medication to you. That's right. So, so now here in the United States, now that medical marijuana is being prescribed by a doctor, this is actually a valid form of medication in these recovery programs. And I've actually partnered with a sober living that's marijuana friendly. And not only that, but the prison system, the court systems are now working with us as an organization to send people to our sober living in particular that has the ability to be marijuana, to be marijuana friendly. You can, if you have your prescription, you can have marijuana. So now we have a sober living that is not only medication friendly if you have a prescription, but it's marijuana friendly if you have a prescription because here in the United States, we're starting to see that it is a good alternative. Now, is it good for somebody who doesn't need it? Probably no. not. No. Just, like, just like, is it okay for somebody who doesn't have a broken leg to be taking pain pills? No. So if you don't have a mental health condition, don't be smoking weed. If you don't I have, you you know say I mean? pull it out of the prison now. I thought you were saying they're going to give marijuana out in prison. That'd be good. Oh no, right? Oh, shit, <laughs> that would probably solve some things. Quinn, Quinn, bro, let's let's wrap it up before we take some questions. I've got two questions for you. One yeah. of them is where people can find you, but more importantly, is there? Do you have any um, wisdom, any words of advice? What's your? Can you share some? Can you wrap it up with some? Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what's your what's your words of wisdom you want to share with the people or team, right? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. First off, I want to say thank you for giving me this platform and the ability to to talk to your audience and stuff. I really appreciate it. Thank you. My number one words of wisdom that I would give to somebody is find out find out exactly what it is that you use for because if you took anything from this from this podcast tonight it's that it's not about the substance it's about our relationship to the substance right so my point of advice would be figure out what that is are you doing it to numb are you doing it to escape are you doing it to validate or mask and why are you doing those things once you understand why you want to use substances to, to mask or numb, escape or whatever, figure out where that comes from. Why do you want to escape that feeling? Why do you want to escape yourself and start to heal? For me personally, the reason why I wanted to escape was because of the self, was because I was had no self-esteem, the worthlessness, the abandonment, the molestation. I wanted to escape that stuff. And then once I finally started to face it, and say and and come to an understanding and acceptance going through the five stages of grief and finally coming to acceptance and saying okay this happened i was molested i was abandoned this all these things happened now where do we go from here do we continue to let it rule our lives or do we move on from it and once i started to love myself and heal and appreciate what i've been through and say dude you're a badass Look at everything that you fucking have accomplished. Like you're alive. Mm. You're alive. You've beat this freaking addiction. Like be happy, be proud of yourself, like be confident. And then I started to love who I was becoming. And I started to work on that person through exercise, through learning, through making amends, through freaking self-discovery. And I started to fall in love with myself again. And I started falling out of love with the obsession of escaping that life. And once I was able to do that, then I could be honest with myself. Is it okay to smoke weed because I need it? Or is it not okay? Is it okay to like explore other alternatives? Is it okay to do these things? Am I doing this to heal or am I doing this to escape? And as long as we are honest with ourselves and we are transparent with ourselves and those around us so that they can help keep us accountable and so we can be accountable for ourselves, then I think that is the most important part. Figure out what's going on with you. Figure out what it is that makes you tick and your addiction tick, and then start to heal from it. Love it, Queen. Thank you, mate. Great, 
words of wisdom. Right, and finally, Quinn, um, finally, yeah, it's an absolute, like I'll just wrap it up by saying that it is an absolute pleasure to have you on here. I'm so grateful to be connected with with yourself and all of our little community that we're... Heck yeah, I'm about. loving the community. Like the <laughs> I'm actually one of the, I don't know, there's not a lot of Aussies um, in this space. Well, I seem to be connected with... Um, a bunch of big American creators. It's just, um, I love it, man. I'm so blessed. Quinn, where can people find you? Uh, and what um, do you got? Anything you want to promote? You can. Um, promote. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, so if you're if you're in the United States, <clears throat> we do. We I am becoming a partner with the Sober Living um, that does marijuana friendly recovery. If you're interested. Um, you're able to reach out to me through Quinstone Motivation at gmail.com. That's Quinstone Motivation at gmail.com. And you can find me on all socials at Quinstone. Um, typically, it's like Quinstone.ig or Quinstone.tt or Quinstone.fb for, you know, at Instagram, TikTok. But yeah, just, just search Quinstone and you'll find me. I'm actually like the, the number one searched Quinstone in the world. So yeah. imagine that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, guys, follow him on all the social platforms. The kid's blowing up everywhere then, which is why I said I'm so grateful to be a part. We're going to take some questions or some comments. It's going to be hard this spring. I've got to try and filter through them. This is where, Katie, I need you to, to find me the comments I can highlight. But I'm going to do my best. Before we wrap it up, I just want to give one more shout-out to Kohani for sponsoring the podcast. Kohani supply our NDIS supports and support coordination. They're helping you help yourself. I love my little – I'm blessed to have these sponsors. Like, they literally funded part of this podcast and – it's nice. great, eh? Like, we're just, I'm just a fucking heroin addict who doesn't use it anymore. <laughs> now I just share my stories on live and I get it's paid awesome. to do it. Like, it's gold, man. Um, awesome. More importantly, all right, so what we're <laughs> going to do now is I'm going to try, you can probably see comments too, Queen. I don't know if you can highlight comments from your end, but I'm going to go back and I don't. Uh, eat time. Oh. I'm going to try and just um find. Uh, he's Katie. Hey, Katie, legend Katie. I wish you had access to this platform so you could highlight my comments. Um, all right, thanks for sharing from Amy. Thank you, Amy. Um, I don't, I can't see the comments. Right. Oh, yeah, cool. They are there somewhere, but anyway, because I can see, I can see which ones you have commented from your people. Um, Nicole says that's Grouse New York thing, but please don't forget where you came from. She's talking about me giving a big shout out to New York. Nicole, please note the Australia flag above my head so I do not ever forget. In fact, I um, resent the implication. <laughs> um, I'm all the way. Um, That's grouse. Is that like a, is that like an insult? Uh, gr no, nah, grou grouse is good, but she's saying don't forget where you come from, which oh, okay. like I said. <laughs> that's that grouse. All. Like that's great? Um. Yeah, yeah, grouse is yeah. You don't know the grouse. Grouse is like the the gouda. A... Gouda, it's like um, <laughs> it's really good. Um, <laughs> my brother, love your work. This is to you, um, from Noel Anthony. Um, Thank you, Noel. Anthony says I had to leave the country. I grew up to get away from cocaine and ecstasy pills. Seen bad in Holland. I think, Anthony, I think we've been chatting. I think Anthony's over there in America as well. I mentioned Miracle. Oh, here. Yeah. Cool, Adam. I mentioned medi marijuana maintenance. I felt like an alien. I wonder where that was. You mentioned that, Adam. Um, and I know that's the case, and that's basically what Quinn's saying, and that's why I think yeah. it's important that we can put this up here for everyone. So, guys, anyone who wants to drop a comment now, at least I'll be able to. Um, highlight that as well. I need to do a control group after the truth. Um, I, I know Beth would have a good comment. You're a true survivor. Congratulations. Oh, Beth, yeah. thank you. Um, I believe I'm legend. Beth helps us out over here. Danny, what's up? Opportunity to get to another badass interview. Thank you so much, Travis. Yeah, you, do you thank know you what? You'll be, able, you'll be able to go through um, all the comments on the Facebook feed. Um, and reply to any if you wanted to. Yeah, definitely. I definitely will. What's this comment? 
I'm surprised there's been no negative comments really. What's he doing? How, bro, how's that possible? Isn't isn't they count marijuana in drugs as a herb so it's optional for recovery addicts to use if he is suffering from any other disease? Yes, that's what we're saying. Shiva, absolutely. Um, Amanda, Amanda J., they, they do stop addicts here from taking certain, certain medical interventions. Amanda's in New Zealand. I wonder what... Um, you're talking about exactly i think I, mean. I think she was probably referring to uh when i was saying you know if you had an opiate addiction you wouldn't restrict a pregnant woman from taking the epidural i think yeah, she was yeah, saying right. that there are there yeah and and you know when i got sober i got nine teeth pulled because my teeth were all rotted out from smoking crack so mm -hmm. i got nine teeth pulled and they they were like you know they knew that I was a recovering addict and they, pres they prescribed me painkillers or they didn't prescribe me, but I was like, if, if they do, I'll take them if I need them. But if I don't, then I won't. And they gave me ibuprofen 800s and they said, Hey, if this is enough, if this isn't enough, let us know and we'll prescribe you Lortab or something else. And going through having nine teeth pulled, I was like, you know what? This hurts, but it's not bad enough that I need the painkillers. And that's what I was talking about. Being honest and transparent with yourself and holding yourself accountable is really being honest with myself and saying, hey, you know what? I can deal with this. This isn't this isn't so bad that I'm like, you know, dying of pain right now. So, no, I don't need this. This is not one of those circumstances where I need this. Now, had I broken both my legs, maybe I would have said, hey, yeah, OK, I'll take the opiates. But in this particular circumstance, I was honest with myself and said, no, I don't need that. Cool. Anthony, um, thanks, Quinn. Um, I hope we doesn't get completely legalized here in Tasmania because it will make the small time dealers switch to selling ice to have extra income. <laughs> yeah, it's always going to be something, but Anthony, you know what I mean? Like, um, Vince says, crack is whack. <laughs> um, crack is whack. Um, what's Katie? I think he said he's three years sober, um, but I missed his age. So Katie wants to know how old I'm you are. I'm 37. There you go. There you go, Katie. Started um, started my addiction when I was 15, so I was basically on opiates on and off and crack and coke and for for 18 years. Legend. Kimmy says, um, um, what a journey, Quinn. Congratulations. So Thank far. you, Kimmy. I mean, um, don't forget the mental health medication. That's this one. Don't forget if you're on mental health medications that slow your heart rate down and smoke marijuana can be very dangerous. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure the doctors will keep you updated on that guy. <laughs> Sorry, I probably missed a bunch. Let me see. Oh, so Stacey's from Quinside. There are medical purposes for marijuana all day, every day. She's from your side. I know that because there's a little link attached to her comment, which must mean. And Stacey, um, another one. Yeah, I know Stacey. All right, glad you didn't kill anybody. I know <laughs> Stacey. He wouldn't be here if he'd murdered that. I shouldn't even say that out loud. Murdered that for those three people. Unless <laughs> he did not. Um, yeah, I'm very, very fortunate that I didn't do something to end, to end up in prison for the rest of my life. so inspiring. Appreciate you sharing Bloody Legend to be so humble after so much. Legend, Sammy. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, there's so many comments up. All right, Queen, I've actually got a meeting with the accountant across the road in seven You're minutes. You're good. I appreciate um, you so much. Brother, thank you so much. Everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Kick the Ship Podcast. Queen, if you just stay there, I'll just end the stream. Later, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Later. Appreciate you.